right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to join us for the session. Um, before I hand it over to Kat, I just want to go over a few housekeeping notes. Um, as you likely have already noticed, audio for attendees has been muted. However, if you have a question during the webinar, you can submit it using the Q&A function. Um, this fun function, unfortunately, is not available if you're viewing via the browser. However, if you're viewing via the Teams app, you can find the Q&A option in the top menu bar. Um, but if you are on the browser and you still want to submit a question, just go ahead and send us those at marketing at onenorth.com and the marketing team will be monitoring for those. Um, so today's session, the backbone of a compelling CX strategy for critical artifacts, will be presented by Kat Collett, One North's Director of Customer Experience Strategy. Kat has been an experienced strategist for more than a decade and brings a multidisciplinary, user-focused approach to innovations in brand, digital, analog, environmental, and interpersonal experiences. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kat. Thank you, Tanya. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, the webinar. I'm so excited to um, see uh, everybody who's coming. I've seen the list. It's got a wide variety of backgrounds, so I'm hoping that everybody will find uh, something for themselves in this conversation about customer experience strategy. Um, and with that, let's roll to our agenda for today. Um, so we have a couple topics we're going to go over. We're going to start with a little bit of an introduction to CX strategy sort of broadly and just level set, what are we talking about today? Um, and we'll move from there into just a couple slides um, about shaping and sharing a CX strategy. After that, we'll get into the meat. So those four critical artifacts that we're talking about uh, that form that backbone of a compelling customer experience strategy. And then we'll wrap up with just a couple of resources for you um, as follow-ups for um, what we've talked about today. Okay, so let's talk about what a CX strategy is. First, I have a quick definition here, just a customer experience. So it can mean a couple of different things. Um, so literally, uh, we can talk about it as that collection of interactions across all the channels uh, that support a company's customer in engaging with them. Um, it also can be used to describe that overall impression that customers have uh, based on all the interactions that they have with a company over time. Um, and specifically, on they, they, um, interacting excuse me, with their products or their services and the people um, who are supporting those products and services. There's another, another definition here that, um, that I also want to touch on. Uh, if we take a kind of one more level of it, this extraction out, uh, the customer experience is really the quality of the relationship that a customer has with a company. That doesn't make that much sense when we think about consumer uh, organizations, but when we start to think about B2B and when different uh, multiple companies are interacting with each other over time, it starts to make a little bit more sense to think about that it adds really a relationship, and again, it's the quality of that relationship. So CX Strategy at One North is one of six strategy disciplines. We're all part of the strategy department. And you can see they all overlap with each other. Uh, we all are interested in similar questions but have our own, uh, each discipline has its own unique perspective. Um, for customer experience in particular, uh, what we help our clients ask is how should we, the clients, shape the reality of engaging with us and our offerings. And CX strategy projects, uh, in general, they answer questions like this. So there's a long list here. Um, but in general, it's how well is what we're doing working for our customers? Um, are we meeting them where they are? Are we offering things of value to them? Are we doing things in a way that really works for them in the broader context of how they work? Um, we may answer just a few of these questions or have that be the goal of a customer experience project. We'll usually get to most of them uh, regardless, with the possible exception of anticipating future needs because that takes a very specific kind um, of research and investigation, uh, more the follow-up investigation and thinking. Um, but we really do touch on, on most of these questions when we do a CX strategy project. Okay, so what is a CX strategy? Um, it's a vision uh, and a plan, and really it is putting something in place that helps align people, processes, and technologies uh, in order to support a future state of a customer experience, and that should be seamless and supportive across all touch points. It also puts in place the foundation uh, for a company to continually revisit and innovate on that experience, ensuring that it stays up to date. Um, that, it, it, that it takes advantage of the most, the most recent sort of innovations in technology, of the most recent expectations, meets those recent expectations of customers. 
Um, it's important to note that when we put together a CX strategy, the things that are included in it, so it does include initiatives, might not be um, customer-facing. So great customer experiences, yes, they're dependent upon those interactions that customers have directly with uh, companies, but everything that's happening on the inside is also really, really important. So a great customer experience is really reliant upon really strong internal relationships and processes um, inside, of, inside of an organization, tools that are integrated and sharing data, specifically data about those customers, but overall. And another quick caveat, um, we're going to talk a lot about customers in this presentation, uh, but when we talk about CX strategy, the work we do is not actually just for customers. So you can replace the word customer with any number of other people um, and think about these these tools, these, the processes of CX, the investigation um, in that space. So we can do employee experience, recruiting experience, supplier experience strategy. All of those things work um, the same way that CX strategy does. It's just a different, in quotes, customer of an organization. Uh, it's an, important, an important little side note about this is that, yes, the customer experience is important. Um, and we said that behind the scenes is really important to support that customer experience. The other four in this list, so employee, well, employees, partners, and suppliers in particular, but yes, also recruiters, um, making sure that they have a good experience is um, critical to providing that good customer experience. It is, it is what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, so indirectly, those experiences impact the customer experience. Okay, so a good CX strategy. We can put a CX strategy in place, but how do we know that it's something that's worth paying attention to? Uh, so there are three things that we look for in a CX strategy. First, it needs to be grounded in the needs of customers, so really oriented toward their lived reality, their context, um, positioned in a way that works for them. At the same time, it also needs to be focused on deepening a company's relationship with their customers. So we don't do things because we're altruistic. We do them because it's good business. Uh, so as we're meeting those needs of customers, we have to make sure that we're also meeting the needs um, of the business that's doing the work. And then finally, we need to ensure that anything we're proposing is a natural and practical extension, or at least naturally and practically enough an extension of a company's current offerings and capabilities. Um, we're, not, we're not sort of taking a sharp left turn here. Uh, this, this is, it'll be additive. When I throw the word enough in there, is yes, of course we also want to dream, um, but we do need to make sure that everything we suggest is practical. We throw that into a Venn diagram. I love a good Venn diagram. You can see that customer experience strategy sits here in the center of the value to our customers, the value to our business, and then that technical and, and uh, fiscal feasibility. So it really makes sense um, to do the work that we're proposing. Okay, so that's a good CX strategy. But what is a compelling CX strategy? That's what we're here to talk about today. Um, so a compelling CX strategy is a good CX strategy, naturally, um, but it also has to have the buy-in and momentum needed for an organization to really push forward with it, to take those nece necessary next steps to make it a reality. Um, okay, so we will get to uh, the, critical art or the, the artifacts that we say form that backbone <clears throat> of the, CX, the compelling CX strategy in a little bit, but first let's talk about, in general, what it takes to shape and share a CX strategy. Uh, so at One North, um, when we talk about CX strategy, we're talking about a fundamentally human-centered approach. So I think many of you on the call will be familiar with this double diamond. We follow exactly that same thing. So we go first into a problem space. We spend a lot of time doing exploration, so empathizing with the customers, understanding their needs, uh, going really, really wide, learning all about their world. Uh, and then bringing it back down um, to something that's useful to us. So taking some time, uh, synthesizing everything we found out in the world, and articulating it down into um, opportunity areas, really. So bringing everything we learned together, uh, we'll talk about insights in just a little bit, but um, finding a way that we can transform what we've learned into opportunity areas for our business. And then we move into that solution space where we brainstorm. So this is the blue sky space where we're like, well, now we know what problems we're trying to solve, so now we're going to imagine what we could possibly do to solve them. Um, this is very similar to any, any number of strategy, uh, strategy disciplines. Here, the, the space we're moving into, though, when we envision, we're, mo we're thinking about digital solutions, we're thinking about human solutions. That's the running theme in CX strategy, is it's not just about a single um, interaction with a single human, it's everybody, and it is a broad exploration of all the different channels and all the different touch points. Uh, once we are complete with that work, we then bring it back again, back down into a focused recommendation, and we pull all the ideas together, uh, turn them into something cohesive, prioritize them, 
um, ensure that they are feasible. Uh, as I said, we do want things to be a little bit practical and then form that into uh, our final recommendation. So that is the X strategy work at a very, very high level. If we dig down uh, one layer, then we'll see there are a number of activities that go into a project. We're likely not going to do all of these in any one project. Uh, we'll pick and choose the one that really makes the most sense given a client's goals um, and put them together into an appropriate plan um, to really meet those goals and establish the right recommendation for that client. Um, but maybe more important than these activities for today's conversation is that throughout these activities, we're producing a variety of artifacts. Um, some of them are really intended to be seen and used by the client. Some of them might be more um, internal in nature, but we have them all. It, it really is the, the, uh, the documentation that supports the entire strategy that we put together. And when we talk about these, uh, these artifacts and deliverables, we're all here to talk about four um, today, the four that we say form that backbone of that compelling customer experience strategy. So in the next uh, section of this talk, we're going to talk about insights, we're going to talk about journey maps, we're going to talk about vision statements, and we're going to talk about illustrative scenarios and how they fit into a customer experience and really help push um, a recommendation for it. Okay, so let's talk about our four critical artifacts, and we will start with insights. So first of all, Let's talk about what insights are. Um, insights are really, they're distilled learnings. They are things that we have seen, uh, usually sort of below the surface layer, um, that point to fundamental truths for humans' experiences. Uh, some of the things that we uncover are unexpected. Um, sometimes they're just validating things that we already think are true but are not 100% sure. The important part about them or the important thing about insights in the context of customer experience strategy work um, is that they do point at the shared experience of customers, and they help us identify opportunity areas where we might look to add new things that serve them, or uh, conflicts where we can really help to resolve them. Um, they are the whys behind what we're seeing in the world. It's, it's our opportunity to understand, we can notice behavior, it's our under, opportunity to understand or articulate why we think uh, people might be behaving the way that they are. Um, you can build insights based on a variety of data, data that you already have, data that you've collected previously. Um, but one of the important parts in our world, one of the things that we think is critical when we're pulling together customer experience insights is that they be based in primary exploratory customer research. So they're, they're much more strong, they're stronger then. Um, so they really can surface the, that lived experience, the context of the people uh, that we're trying to represent through those insights. So let's take a look. Um, this is, uh, well, I'm going to take a step back and, and talk about what we're going to share as examples for all of this. Um, we have completely fabricated a client called, this is, uh, I know this is a brilliant name, Complexico. If I were in brand, I'm sure that it would be um, a lot more charming than that is, but that's the name of our company, Complexico. We've done a customer experience strategy project for them, and what we'll be sharing with you today um, is made up uh, examples of our insights, our journey maps. Um, our, what is it, I'm blanking, the um, vision statement and then the illustrative scenario, excuse me. Uh, so Complexico, insights, this is what they might look like in action. So they really are just statements um, that are highlighting things that we've learned in the field when we sort of, when we sort of dug beneath, made connections, um, read right between the lines really of the things that the, the participants in the research were telling us. Um, we generally categorize them, so we know here for Complexico, the insights that we have are going to be grouped into logistic support, innovation, and community. And when we share an insight, it really usually looks like a big statement, and then we pull in a couple of key quotes that back up uh, the claim that we're making about the, our client's customer base. Um, so here are just a couple of examples. I do have, uh, for each of these, you'll see we'll follow the same format for each of these um, artifacts. Uh, I do have a couple of quick just notes about what insights are and what they're not. Um, so when, we are, when we're doing this work, when we're trying to gather these insights, we're really trying to put together the foundation for brainstorming. We're trying to understand uh, what, what customers are thinking and feeling sort of behind the scenes. Not necessarily um, we can see what they're doing, but we want to understand that why. Importantly, when we look at insights, they are qualitative in nature. We don't have data to back them up. Um, 
met, well, we have data from the field. We don't have quantitative large data to back them up. We can get that if that's important to a client. We can certainly send out follow-up surveys to pull information in to validate what we've learned in the field. Um, but they really are intended to be qualitative and point us toward, um, again, those opportunities for making a difference for customers. A couple things they're not. They're not simple observations. So we do look, we do look for sort of in between to find these insights. Um, and one of the important ones here on the right uh, that I do want to call attention to is that they're not necessarily what our clients say to be true or complete. So it really is the customer's impressions. And that's important because you can have a certain intent around what you're putting out into the world, but if that's not what's landing with the customers and they have a different impression of it, it's really, really important to know. Um, so we might not feel like they're true, but they are what's true for the customers. There are a number of benefits um, to producing insights as part of a customer experience strategy project. Um, most importantly, they help us really understand customers as whole people. And again, I've said this a couple times already, they're highlighting opportunities um, to provide something new for those customers. But one of the things that I think is, is really critical about them is this, it's this third bullet point here where we have this opportunity to understand uh, where our hidden biases might live. So where do we have beliefs that we don't even know our beliefs that might not even be true around our customers. Uh, once, we, once we sort of expose those, we have new opportunities, new ways to think about them, and we can find new ways to serve them. Okay, so insights. That's all well and good. We can see what they are. Um, for each of these uh, artifacts, I have a, little, a few quick tips about getting started. Um, this looks like it's as easy as one, two, three. I will tell you, uh, step three here usually takes a couple of weeks to do. Um, but in general, this is the way that we would get started with insights. So the first thing we do is just take a look at ourselves. Um, so what, it is, what is it that we say we're offering that's of value to our customers? How are we interacting with them today? How are we supporting them? And then what are our goals around those relationships? Step two. We talk to the customers. This is, this is critical. Um, this is going to be a theme that runs throughout. We definitely want to spend time um, with the people who are our customers. So we learn about how our offerings interaction, inter and interactions support them and don't um, understand their goals. But maybe more important than that, we start to get a sense of the world they're living in beyond what, we're, what it is that we say that we're doing for them. And then finally, synthesis. So we bring everything that we learned in the field back, um, surface those themes, and then find, uh, find that those in-betweens, those, the needs that they have, the things that they're not necessarily saying. They might say it, they might not necessarily be saying it, but that we can start to see as we look across a number of uh, responses from a number of people. Um, within that, we can look for proof of alignment or lack of alignment um, between ourselves and our customers. So where are we doing things that really are working for our customers and where are we not? And again, this is where we'll start to see those opportunities. Um, a quick note about this, you know, it doesn't take that many people. We don't have to talk to that many people to get really, really good information. Uh, depending upon the scope of what you are defining as the customer experience you're investigating, it can be as few as seven people. So, of course, if you're a large organization and you're taking on end-to-end um, -end customer experience for all of the different kinds of customers you serve, that's not going to be enough. But we can get a lot. We can learn a lot just by talking with a pretty small number of people. Um, and at least have the, it at least sets us going in the right direction. Okay, so journey maps. Um, a journey map, simply put, is just a visualization of the shared experience the customers have of interacting with a company. Importantly, it is always from the customer's point of view. We're writing it down, but it really is intended to uh, reflect that customer's point of view. And the thing about them that is, is really, really interesting is that they provide um, a really rich narrative. They, they sort of show the story of what our ongoing relationships look like with customers. Uh, I think, you know, journey maps, um, journey maps have a lot of buzz in the industry right now. I do want to point out that there are different kinds of experience maps that might be brought to bear in different contexts. So we're going to talk about journey maps today, but other kinds of maps you can see over here on the right that we might bring in, it really depends on the context of, of a project that we're working on. Uh, we, might, we might pull together um, an ecosystem map, just understand all the tools and technology that are in, that are in place we might start to uh, work towards a service blueprint. So understanding really what are those internal people, processes, tools that are being brought to bear in service of that customer experience. And we might, we might stick with something um, a little bit more abstract, an empathy map. So focus really on the feelings uh, that our customers are having. 
And similarly, um, we can use the maps in a variety of ways. So um, we'll see on the next slide when we talk about what they are and are not. Uh, they can't really represent everybody. So we, can, we may have to build multiple. They might reflect the experience of one persona that we've established. Um, we can use them to uh, reflect what's happening today. You can also use them to imagine what might happen in the future. So you can put together a future state um, map. And then um, you know, when we talk about scope, uh, we can do end to end, sure, that's a lot to take in, but you also can, if, it's, if it is um, appropriate for a project you're taking on, narrow the focus of your journey map to just be one part of the journey, so one little, one little piece of it, and then piece them together uh, over time as you, as you gather additional information about the overall journey. Um, as for insights, we like to base these in primary exploratory research. Uh, the reason for this is that um, they can, they can reflect the real, the real context, so we can really see. It's best, obviously, with the pandemic, we've been doing this remotely, but this is best if you can actually get into their physical world as well and sort of see where they're working, um, what they're doing sort of around uh, the things they do when they're interacting with you, et cetera. So, so pull back that context and weave it into the journey map. Back to Complexico. So here is one journey map um, for a small widget reseller, and you didn't know Complexico sold widgets, did you? They, uh, they offer widgets and they work through resellers. So this is the journey map for a smaller widget reseller and service provider. Um, I have a, a way to zoom in here, it's a lot to take a look at. But I think the important thing when we're looking at um, a CX journey map to sort of distinguish it from other disciplines where you might see them um, is that they have, um, they're, they're both at a higher level and they're more complicated. Uh, so what we have here and what makes this, this so rich is that it, it involves all of the different roles within a customer that we might interact with, that Complexico in this case might interact with or support. Um, so it breaks it down. Usually when you're talking about a customer experience journey, you're not talking about the journey of a single individual. You're talking about the journey over time between two organizations with multiple people partnering with multiple people in service of one goal. Um, so this pulls it all together and we can art start to understand the different roles these might be grouped into different collections of humans, depending upon how big or small this reseller is, but the different roles that are brought to bear. You can understand the kinds of, at a high level, uh, things that they are thinking about, things that they're trying to accomplish. Um, and then at the bottom, start to dig into sort of that, that collective pain across the organization. So this, um, again, in contrast to a user experience journey map, is really the journey of a whole company um, across its relationship with another company. If we take a look at, again, what they are and what they are not, um, we know that they're aggregate and they're abstract in nature. One of the important things to really think about when you are to really know about journey maps is that they're not intended to be a comprehensive log of every little thing um, that any one individual is doing. It really is experiential in nature. So we're trying to really understand um, broadly what are they trying to get done here and where are they struggling. We likely will find some of the smaller details as we're doing this work. Um, but it is, um, in general, about that sort of overall impression, those collective needs, the collective frustrations, so that we can start to point solutions towards those. It's another way to surface uh, opportunities. And benefits. So just like with insights, there are a lot of benefits uh, to having journey maps. Um, one of the primary ones is just having a simple reference, a shared reference and a shared understanding, something that we can point to uh, as we're trying to make decisions in subsequent projects. So it's a, it's a collective memory, really, of what we know about, about our customers, including their context. So we understand why they're happening, when they're happening, and what else we need to know about what's happening around frustration points in order to alleviate them in a way that really works. Um, they're really critical input for design work, so that is the sort of down-the-road work that we're talking about. Um, and then at the bottom here, one of the, these, these two are actually really interesting to think about. So one of the things that I've noticed over time in interacting, especially with larger organizations, is that everyone thinks that their, their customer is different. Um, they are. All, they're all, all unique human beings. But one of the things about uh, working together and finding efficiencies is locating where those commonalities are becomes critical. So when you have a journey map, you can start to see that. You're like, oh, yes, well, they are different in small ways, but there's this bigger picture here where they have a lot in common and we can serve, we can serve them in a common way until we get to sort of those, those final small details at the end. Um, and then this last one uh, is more internally uh, focused than externally, but one of the things that they do surface sometimes is where um, the customers are really starting to see 
what's happening inside of an organization. This is, this is uh, related to a favorite quote from a colleague of mine, which is that the customer doesn't care about the org chart. If they can start to see where departments aren't working together, that's a real problem. Uh, so this can then point to us internally. Hey, here's where we need to do work. Here's where some of our departments are actually not collaborating as effectively as they might be. And if we fix that, it will make a huge difference for our customers. Again, one, two, three, simple as that. We'll have a journey map. Um, so again, it takes longer than that. One of the things I do want to say here is step two is exactly the same as step two for insights. We're going to be spending time talking to our customers. We usually do this at the same time. So when we do research, we go out, we have our assumed journey, we understand what our questions and assumptions are. We know that we want to have a conversation and kind of poke into the context and understand what our customers are doing um, over the course of interacting with the client. Uh, but one, two, three, we start with that assumed journey. So we do know a lot about our customers um, from what we've put in place, from what we've seen them doing when they interact with our, um, with our system. We also know uh, some of their frustrations. So many organizations now have um, pretty robust customer satisfaction departments. We learn a lot from that or just from uh, emails, all the complaints, stuff on social media. We know frustrations. Um, we also probably have some questions. A quick note here. Um, if you don't really know where to start, if you're not really sure uh, how to put together an assumed journey, a quick, a quick place to start is just with the, the five E's, uh, which is uh, explore, enter, engage, um, exit, and extend. Uh, that's the way that we're talked about in the consumer and commerce world. I usually flip the last two when I'm doing either B2B or non-commerce projects. But it's a really, really easy place to start. And then as it turns out that that's not nuanced enough for you, of course, you can break it down into um, other phases that you, can, that you might use instead. At any rate, once we have that, uh, we go out into the field and we, again, talk to our customers. So we ask them, and more importantly, we ask them to show us um, if they can. And so this is, this is challenging when we're talking about remote research, but when you are physically with the customers, you absolutely can ask them to take a minute and show you. Um, you will notice things that they, ha that they don't report. Great to get their reports, even better to see it yourself. Uh, but in this time, you can also start to test out some of the assumptions you have and get answers to the questions that you have. And then that's it. So you bring it back, um, you bring everything back, and you synthesize again, so find the themes within, and then start adding things to uh, your assumed journey map. It may turn out that you need to start over, that your journey actually didn't have the right details uh, to represent what you really want to say about that journey. Great, that's fine too. So move things around. It's a chance to start reflecting what you've seen to be the truth. Um, and take what you've learned in the field and translate it into uh, the activities that they're doing, the feelings that they're having, uh, frustrations, and ultimately um, the finding, identifying those needs so we can, we can start to meet them in, in new ways. Okay, so we're done with the first half of our double diamond. Those, those two artifacts uh, came out of the problem space, and we're going to move now into the solution space, and we're going to talk again about that vision statement and then ultimately about illustrative scenarios. Um, so let's start with vision statements. Um, a vision statement really is just a sentence, uh, but the intent is that it be a really inspiring sentence. Uh, we use vision statements to succinctly articulate a purpose and a direction um, around a, customer's, a client's customer experience. Uh, they're intended to really be a North Star um, that, is, that provides context for a follow-on initiatives, whether they are implementation, design, or further research. It doesn't really matter. It's still that North Star. So why are we here? Who, what are we doing next? It's really important that vision statements stay agnostic uh, with respect to specific implementations. Uh, when we put vision statements together, um, our intent is really to help our clients shape a way of being for the future for themselves. So who is it that they are going to be for and with their customers, and how will that being help them serve customers better? Um, it's not about I'm going to do something and that is going to change everything. It's really about who we want to be. It's really important that we stay in that space because then um, really any implementation is possible. You can cast a wide net uh, there, and you can use them also to focus on incremental changes but also um, to point towards spaces where you might want to do innovation. It is not uh, prescriptive in nature in any fashion. Here's an example again for our, our client Complexico. Uh, so they deal with complexity, 
we broke, we've broken it down. We have a, a, a long form and a short form. So this is actually something um, that we do uh, pretty frequently. So we put together a longer, um, more explicit, uh, more detailed um, vision statement, customer experience vision statement for the client. And then, you know, it's, it takes a lot to take that in. So it's useful uh, when, we are, when we are spending time in deeper conversations, but it's not something that really resonates necessarily. And so we'll often make um, another version, maybe even two versions of it, where we, we put together one that feels more like an, a rallying cry. Again, internally, um, it could translate into something related to the externally facing branding as well, but this is really uh, intended to be internal. And so you can imagine taking something like making the complex feel simple. Everyone in an organization can be looking for ways to do that as part of serving customers over the course of their, of their day, over the course of their career. Again, what they are, what they're not. Um, so a vision is, again, it's that overarching, that North Star, that overarching narrative. Um, and it's, it's intended really to be a framing uh, for those individual initiatives. So I mentioned design, more research, um, implementation. It's really a way that we can, uh, or a, um, a, it's almost like a feeling that we can apply or an intent, that an intent is a better word, that we can imply when we're doing all the work we do inside of shaping a customer experience. And you can see a lot of things that it is not. Uh, it's not externally facing, not a recommendation. Um, it's not a brand strategy. It's not a tagline. It's not any of those things. It really is that internally facing uh, North Star um, to help a company with its own direction um, as, it, as it continually shapes and reshapes its customer experience. Um, benefits for a vision statement. So uh, they provide that focus and, and goal for an organization. Uh, and again, as I said before, without being attached to a specific implementation. So they really are that framing of priorities. Um, I, I'll keep coming back to the phrase North Star. It's that, that thing that we can keep in mind, like what is it we're striving for all the time? Um, and as I said, it, it can inform both the shorter term and longer term work. But I do want to say the biggest benefit of putting together a vision um, is the work that we do internally to do it uh, and the alignment that we can create. So coming to a CX vision statement means bringing senior leadership into agreement around who they say they want to be for their customers. And to that end, this is what it looks like to put a vision statement together. So first, we gather that input. And this, again, is done with those internal, uh, usually executive leaders. So we start with our internal stakeholders. I've included here. Um, the two things that I usually ask or that we include in our workshops when we're trying to get to a vision statement, um, I find it really inspiring and easy uh, to hear about people's proud moments, serving customers in particular, um, and then what they're aspiring to. Everybody has dreams for the company they work for. Uh, so start to collect those because that is all of the input that you need in order to put together a CX vision. It's also a great lead-in if you're, if you're doing this in the context of a workshop. It's a really, really great way to set a very positive tone leading into ideation. Uh, so once we have all this input, um, just like before, we find our common themes. So we figure out what's already great. So what is it that we can build upon as we establish this vision? Um, what, is our, what is our client already known for? Uh, how do, we don't, we're probably not going to change that, but we will likely want to build upon it. Um, find those common dreams. And then, importantly, figure out where there's overlap between what it is that we're dreaming of and what we know about our customers' needs and goals. Um, this really is where we identify uh, the heart. So what, what is the heart or the soul of the business look like? Who are they? Um, and again, back to this conversation on being. Who are they when they're with? Who are they being when they're with their, their customers? Um, and then finally, we distill that vision statement. So we craft a sentence. Um, we make sure that the stakeholders are, are, the stakeholders are aligned and that they see themselves in that statement. Uh, and then we edit a lot. And then we edit some more and probably some more because these get very, very long and very, very wordy. And with that, they become unclear. Um, quick note at the bottom, yes, I love the thesaurus. It is often my best friend. You can probably tell that from having experienced this, this presentation. Um, but it's really important to bring in the words that, that add the meaning that you want, but that are not um, unclear. You want this to be very, very clear, very, very um, accessible to the people who are going to interact with it. And finally, uh, illustrative scenarios. So an illustrative scenario is a narrative story 
uh, with, that has an intent to bring a customer experience concept to life. So we've stepped over a really important piece here, which is what the concepts are themselves. Um, once we've done brainstorming, we, we pull all that together and we, think, we say, well, here are some things, some new uh, ways that we might interact with customers, and we group them together into something that we call a concept. It can be a tiny concept. It can be a huge concept, um, like the overall way that sales interacts with the customers. For example, it can be something like that. Um, so we've done all that work. Uh, and here, what we're looking to do with these illustrative scenarios is really make them seem real. Uh, when we talk about a definition for any of our concepts or for some of the enablers that we uh, mentioned need to be put in place underneath in order to bring them to life, it feels very, very abstract. And it's really, really hard to translate that in your mind into a future state reality, um, a future state experience for that customer. Uh, so we bring in this idea of split scenarios. And here's what they look like. So this is, this is one way that they might be manifested. Uh, so it's re it really, as I said, it's just a story. Um, but what we're trying to do is highlight new ways of interacting, new kinds of support. Um, it can include things like um, uh, wireframes, or here I've even, it's even a mock-up of notifications on a phone, on a phone screen. Um, it doesn't have to. It really, really depends on what you're trying to communicate. Uh, here in this example, we've used photography. It can also be done with illustration. Um, in general, uh, we try to limit them to somewhere around 10, uh, 10 steps. Um, you'll see when we get to the one, two, three of illustrative scenarios, there's a lot of editing in here too, so you really want to keep it to that, that key elements, the core story um, that communicates what that future state will be like and how you'll be supporting customers in um, new ways. Importantly, uh, they are imagined. So just like I offered a lot of disclaimers around Complexico at the beginning of this presentation, uh, when we share illustrative scenarios, we offer a lot of disclaimers, um, saying this is made up. It's not real. You're not seeing anything that has been completed yet. It really is just pointing us in a direction for that future state experience. Um, they're an opportunity to show, showcase innovation, too. So the, the things that we're illustrating might not even be, uh, they might be sort of at the edge of possible right now. It might, we might be waiting for a new technology to um, be proven before we can really, um, you know, really start focused work on some of the aspects. But that's okay. This really is about inspiring. Um, it, it's, it's about providing uh, a direction for that experience. And when you break it down into a roadmap, there are pieces of it that won't be achieved until mm, three, five years out. But there are also things that you can start working on now. So it's, it's another version of that North Star, this time for the experience um, itself. On the right, you can see um, it is not real. I think I've said that about eight times now, still not real. Um, and it's not intended to be complete. This is really all about direction. They do provide really, really great input uh, for design processes. Um, so it's a little bit of a, a jump start. Um, you can actually start testing the ideas right up front as you're starting to think about what real designs might look like. But they are not complete in any way, shape, or form. They do come with a lot of benefits, though. So as I said before, when we're talking about concepts and enablers, they're pretty abstract in nature. Uh, Stories really land. And this is why, for all of human history, we have communicated through story. It's what people remember the best. Um, and it really can, it can help them uh, feel more what something will be like. Um, so they do bring that abstract into a place where people can understand it. Um, they build buy-in uh, for follow-up initiatives, for follow-up initiatives. So you see it. They're exciting. They're intended to be uh, something like, I want that. I want that now. I see how that would be amazing. They're exciting. And this is one of the things. Um, but one of the things about them, they're not just sort of the end for a, a customer experience project. They're socialization materials. They're things that can be shared uh, throughout an organization to really get more people on board, to help them understand, um, to help them start to find ways that they might help move toward that final state or that ultimate state. And as I said before, uh, they, they can help, they can help co uh, companies get a jump start on design processes. Um, one note about format for them, uh, the ones that I shared here were done in slide format. That's the, the easiest uh, possibly way to put them together. It's inexpensive. Um, but the, the idea of um, an illustrative scenario is not that it be in any one medium. So we can do it with slides, but you can also turn it into a script. You can, you can uh, produce it as a video. Um, I've been involved in projects where we've actually turned them into large-scale installations that could be put in place at a company's headquarters so you could interact with it and really understand it sort of at a, um, a more visceral level. Uh, they also can be higher level in nature. So just a simple storyboard or even a mood board can really communicate a lot um, in, in, as, a, as an illustration of a concept. 
and finally getting started. So here, um, this, is, this is really like writing a story because it is writing a story. So we start with creating just an outline. We identify um, the benefits that we might want to highlight. Uh, we establish some characters, so who do we need to include and in as few as possible uh, because we don't want things to get overly complex. It's hard for people to remember over time. But then we, we, we marry those two and start to weave in elements from the concepts um, that we are trying to illustrate. It may be that you need more than one um, scenario to communicate your entire uh, future state picture. That's fine. Um, I've done three distinct stories to tell kind of three different aspects of a future state customer experience. I've done three that are, that are serial uh, to really talk about different points of view. You can put them together any way that you want, um, but the point is use them to tell the story of what the future state will be like for your customers. Um, in step two, we start adding details, and then we simplify. Here we are back at editing. Um, we, and we start to understand and think about what kinds of illustrations we might want. Is it a photograph? Um, is it a wireframe? Is it something else entirely? Uh, and importantly here, it's, we work with our clients to make sure we find the right people to help us make sure um, that the details we're including feel real because there is nothing that will take someone out of an inspired state quicker than reading something and like, well, that's, that's not what it's really like. That doesn't make any sense. So we need to make sure that they feel real enough, um, which sometimes makes them, means making them feel a little bit less detailed so that more people can see themselves in uh, the scenario than might if you, can, if you stay very, very detailed. And, and then finally, we, we layer in design. So this is where we take uh, what is hopefully well-structured and we make it really, really wonderful to interact with. So uh, we find the source imagery. We develop wireframes if we need to. And then we bring it all um, together visually. And as a quick note here, um, one of the things that's important uh, when we are putting together scenarios is it's more than just the story. It's actually also an opportunity um, for you to highlight your culture, um, specifically around diversity and inclusion. So think about that. Uh, be mindful of it as you're pulling together your characters, as you're starting to find the imagery. Um, it really speaks volumes beyond what you're actually trying to say about uh, the customer experience. I do have a, cute, a few quick footnotes. So that, that wraps up our four um, critical uh, artifacts. So I have a few quick footnotes about this. Um, one important note about all of them, all four of them, is that they're living documents. So this isn't the kind of thing where you go through this process and then you have a thing that is permanent and unchangeable and a, a, an absolute truth. It's not what they are. Um, they're intended to be updated as we learn more. We are always learning more if we're doing our jobs right, we're spending more time with customers, we're getting additional feedback, and also the world changes. So journeys change, expectations change. They need to be revisited over time. I mentioned this at the beginning. Uh, it's not just for customers. There's a, here's a little bit more, um, a little more texture about what it might look like to do this work for these other categories of in quotes customer. Uh, so for employees, this is taking a look. Um, it's really at the employee experience. So often we think about uh, pay um, and benefits when when we're thinking about employee experience and what it is like to interact and have a culture. But this is this is the side of it that um, I think is talked about less about giving employees the resources they need to contribute their best work. So do they have the tools they need? Are the processes working for them? Um, do they know, can they see that they're making a difference and are they feeling appreciated by the customers for the work that they're doing? In the recruiting space, um, this is pretty simple. So how do we make sure that what we're doing, what the recruiting experience is doing for us is attracting the best possible employees for our organization? And that doesn't necessarily mean the best talent on its own. It's the best talent and fit. Is it a good match in both directions for uh, your company? With respect to partners, um, these are, uh, partners and um, here the intent is the people who help us deliver um, our service or our offering. Uh, so how do we support them? They're a big part of um, the customer experience if you are relying on people who do installation work or maintenance work. They're a huge part of the customer experience. So how do you make sure that they are having a wonderful experience? Uh, for a couple of reasons. Both the end customer will be pleased and they'll want to do work with you more and be advocates for your brand out in the world. And then finally, suppliers. I think we've all seen in the last couple of years that the supply chain has been really disrupted um, by the pandemic. Um, we can't fix the pandemic, but we can, in general, with supply chain, figure out what can we do uh, to make it as easy as possible for our suppliers to sell their products to us. Like, where are we providing friction that is causing them to be maybe a little cranky with us? Is there something we can do differently to make their lives easier and therefore become a preferred customer of theirs? 
Um, and finally, we've talked about getting started with the artifacts themselves, um, but you may be wondering if you haven't done any work in the CX strategy space, like how do you just get started overall? Um, and what we say is just really start with planning and completing just a little bit of discovery work. You probably already have a lot of information. Um, start with that, but also make sure that you are getting to know your customers. You are spending time with them if you're not already, and you're pulling in the qualitative information. Get really curious about them. And the important thing here is to explore what you don't know that you don't know. Um, and second, it might be a good idea to consider engaging a third party here. Um, it can be helpful when you're doing work like this to have an outside perspective. Um, they can also bring in expertise that you might not have in the house. Um, but the most important thing that they'll do for you is question assumptions you have that you might not even be aware are assumptions. So both of these really are pointing to make sure that what you're doing is spending time learning what you don't know that you don't know. Um, okay, so I think we have some time for questions. Yes, and so as a reminder, if you join via the Teams app, you'll be able to submit questions via the Q&A um, function. If you're joining via the browser and you still have questions, go ahead and email us at marketing at onenorth.com. We've been monitoring that and we'll throw them here into Teams via the Q&A as well. Uh, so we're just going to take like 20 seconds to kind of regroup on the questions that have come through and we'll be back to kick off the Q&A section. All right, so let's kick off the Q&A. Um, the first question is, what is your recommended way of keeping the living documents organized and making sure everyone is on the same page? This is such a good question. Uh, that is really hard. It takes a lot of discipline. Um, honestly, I'm the last person you should ask about that. Um, but I think that if, um, if, I'm, if, I, if I think about it from just a, uh, at a high level, um, it's, it's really putting in a practice of, re, of revisiting them. So the documents themselves, obviously put them someplace where everyone can access them. Make sure that um, people know where they are, that they're named effectively, all of that kind of thing. But I think that it's, it's establishing an appropriate cadence for you, for the, your organization, to revisit them with intentionality. So whether that's every two years doing a complete revisit of an entire SDX strategy, every six months revisiting a journey map saying, have we learned anything new? Every three months ensuring that you're putting some more research in and going out and grabbing some more insights, kind of pushing at what you already have and adding to it. Um, I think that's actually the most important thing. Uh, and then if you have discipline around all of that, the documentation um, really should take care of itself because part of each of those initiatives would be updating, communicating, um, et cetera, and making sure that everyone remains on that same page and can continue moving forward uh, in, a, in, a, in the same, same direction. Awesome. Um, we actually have a, a question that came through Twitter, um, and this is in reference to uh, one of your slides that said you really only need about seven people to get enough input to surface reliable CX insights. So mm -hmm. this person says, doesn't that depend on who those seven people are and how di diverse the perspectives they're bringing to the table? Also, isn't it important what kind of business you have and how diverse your audience is? Yes, yes, to all of those things. So that seven comes with a lot of caveats. That is in a very focused study with very specific questions. And even when you're talking about um, bringing in seven people, you want to make sure that they are not seven like-minded people with similar backgrounds. And so when we're putting together um, a research uh, proposal, we first of all establish goals for it. Um, we do want to understand um, are there any audiences that are not automatically considered? So where are maybe some, where, who's at the margins? Uh, how, do we, how do we introduce inclusivity, really, as we're, as we're putting together our pool of research participants? Keep all of that in mind. And then also some of the more, um, uh, some of the things that are more oriented towards the business school. So whether that is um, verticals or uh, different personas or different, um, different departments that they might be interacting with or any number of things, we start to figure out, well, which ones do we want to make sure we touch on in order to get the information that we need? We put together a matrix. And then, well, then we need to have two people that look kind of like this and two people that look kind of like this. And not uh, when we say two people that have, maybe two people that are in um, 
finance, for example. It may not be that the two people in finance are the same two people that are of a certain demographic. It may be that you split the different criteria across um, multiple participants in order to, uh, in aggregate, get a full sense um, from a, and have that variety of perspectives that you're looking for. And the other thing I'll say about that is that I, you know, when we come back and we have these insights and we put the journey maps together, um, again, they're not in quotes true. They're a good directional starting point. And so, if you recognize that there's a voice that hasn't been heard, go get it and add it into the mix. I think that's it's actually a really important question that we can continually be asking every day in everything that we do, like have I included all the people that need to be included? Is there someone that, you know, and, and you know, make a list, prioritize it, and figure out how you pull them in over time um, in order to get that richer picture. Uh, the problem with trying to do it all at once is first it would be an extraordinary amount of data <laughs> to then sift through and try to pull insights together, and it would be really expensive. And so I think, you know, starting smart and figuring out either um, a smaller area where you want to do the research, a smaller collection of key customers where you want to do the research, defining it well, learning from that, and saying, look, look what we learned from this. Look at how we're shaping and shifting the way that we're working. And you'll get and get the more, more money to go out and do that more of uh, that broader exploration and bring in the additional perspectives and grow it over time. The next question is, when doing a CX project, what does a typical team look like? Mm. Um, a typical team. So we, at, at One North, um, we pull together teams based on a variety of things. Um, you know, what we look to do is bring in people who might have, uh, so obviously expertise in CX strategy and our processes and our deliverables and all of that kind of stuff um, to, bring, to bring that to bear on the project and really sort of lead uh, the work that we're doing. We also look, if it's, a, if it's work that where it seems like it will be um, of a certain nature, like for example, if it, will, if it will likely be heavily digital in nature, we will likely bring a user experience strategist onto the team as well. Um, if it's a, a vertical where having um, specialized knowledge is really, really critical, like for example in healthcare, if we have someone uh, that we can bring onto the team who can bring that perspective or even just spend a half an hour with us kind of helping us understand where some of the gotchas might be in, an, in a vertical if it's new to more of us, um, we, will, we will do that. Uh, so they're usually smaller teams, um, but we, we basically by design have them be interdisciplinary um, because we know that we're going to be reaching across a variety of things. Actually, an important piece of that is bringing a technologist in as well because one of the things that we often do is spend time um, with our clients behind the scenes, understanding the tools that they have and make available to their customers, but also internally as well, sort of getting a lay of the land and kind of how all those things fit together. So do they, do they already have um, and where might they need to work on having an integrated set of tools um, and processes and, importantly, the data that lives underneath all of it. So it kind of, it's, CX is a little bit of a, a kind of, I think of everything as cake. So there's this layer of like the CX expertise and then you kind of drill all the way down. You need to bring in all the expertise you need for a given project. So that's a very long-winded way of saying it depends. <laughs> yeah. Love it. All right, last question we got here. Um, you know, knowing that you've been doing experience work for a decade now, um, and also knowing that you might not be able to name specific clients, but in general, what's been your favorite CX project you've worked mm -hmm. on? Either what have you learned or what made it so special? Yeah. That's, that is a really hard question. Um, I think my, my teams know that I develop platonic crushes <laughs> on all of my clients and all of the research participants. Um, I, I think that what I would actually point to uh, in this work, it's, it's not actually about one project or another project. It's sort of the overarching opportunity to spend time with people that I wouldn't naturally spend time with in my day-to-day -day life, um, learn more about what, what makes their lives work, um, what their contexts are like. Um, I've, I've learned things in agriculture that I never expected I would learn. I have learned things in the IT world that I never expected I would learn. I've learned in medical device. Like I've, there's, I've, I've been, I've, I've had the good fortune of playing in a number of industries, uh, but it all comes down to expanding sort of my horizons and spending time with really amazing people with different perspectives, all of whom really I can't think of any example of anyone I interacted with who wasn't just out there to try to make a difference, and that's what we're here to do, is help them make a difference through CX strategy work. Awesome. And Kate, just let me know, there's actually one more that okay. came through. That is, how has technology influenced CX strategy? Mm. AD testing, broader samples, real-time user behavior, iterative design, and development? Yes. 
Um, so when I when I you know it's easy to think of um, this work as being linear in nature, as in you would first do sort of a brand strategy and a CX strategy, and that would and then everything would kind of unfold from that, uh, which then has things like you're mentioning seem like they're downstream um, from CX strategy work. But it's cyclical. This work is, is cyclical in nature. And so everything that you're talking about um, is ways to sort of gather more input. And all of that becomes input for sort of that next round, that next revisiting of the CX strategy. Uh, we can learn a lot from doing the CX strategy work itself. But then as we start to try things out, so that can be even through just validation testing of um, whether it's a high-level concept or a, a CX concept or a US concept, we learn from that, and that's just more information that we bring back into our pool. And when we do A-B testing, when something is out in the world, um, it's more information. We bring that back in, into the pool. When we hear things from our customers, and we're like, oh, that's how, that, that's how that's going for you, more information. And it just comes back into that, that pool of data that we have. And then when it's time to dust off our CX chops and say, yeah, let's revisit. Things have changed. We've learned new things. How do things need to adapt? That's where we're doing it in a big way. If we learn something... Um, if we learn something quickly that uh, kind of contradicts a big premise in our CX strategy, uh, then we might revisit it quickly and in a very focused way. But in general, everything that you're talking about there is just that all of that is collecting more information that then is brought back in when it's time um, to revisit. Awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you so much to Kat for a great presentation. Um, and I know this is another question that we generally get a lot. Um, and we will be making the slides and the recording from today's session available on our blog. Uh, I would say early next week at the latest, it will be live. So look out for that, and we will send an email with those links once it's ready. Um, if you have any questions coming out of the webinar that you didn't ask live, again, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at marketing at onenorth.com. We'll make sure that Kat gets those questions. Um, and again, I, I put it in the, the chat here, but if you found this session valuable and you don't want to miss out on future webinars or thought leadership, blog posts, et cetera, on the topic and other relevant topics, be sure to visit onenorth.com slash subscribe to sign up for our newsletter. Um, thanks again, Kat, and to everyone for joining. I hope you all have a wonderful day.